Thank you so much for these, uh, if I may say, uh, both arresting and moving <laughs> talks. Um, I, since we are, we are, we are a bit over um, time, I'd suggest that we might, if there should be any questions already in the audience, we might, might open up the floor right away. So, so I can, yeah, yes, there's a question. In the, Francesco, I, okay. <coughs> I would have a question for Catherine. Um, I also discovered that, uh, that Harvard Educational Review magazine when I was doing my research uh, a few years back, and I also wrote an essay then that started off from uh, a comparative reading of Woods's article and the Carlos article that share quite a lot uh, in, their, uh, in their argument, somehow exactly arguing that the city is the school and all of that. Uh, then my, my, my interest was then to, to look at how the, the architects within themselves emerged out of that uh, discussion and so how did they move from text to drawing and to building somehow. So I compared also some of their buildings and in particular the fact that both of them uh, took part to the same competition more or less uh, a few years back. Uh, for a university in Dublin, so I, I compare those two. And I also compare the way in which the two articles were illustrated. Uh, if you looked at it, uh, De Carlo is illustrating his article only with photographs of students, uh, students protesting in 1968, but also students uh, in a very tradition, understood in a very traditional way. Whereas Woods is illustrating it with his own drawings of his own projects and particularly with the famous Berlin Free University diagram. Uh, so I just wanted to know your, what is your opinion, let's say, about how they, they operated as architects, how they translated those ideas of walking somehow uh, within their own, uh, their own projects, in particular maybe with relation to the very celebrated then uh, Berlin Free University. Well, um, oh. well, I don't know, uh, is the answer to that. I'm not an architect historian. I don't follow the work of architects in that, in that sense. What I was really interested in, in that publication in, that came out in 1969, was first of all the Harvard Educational Review being interested enough to commission um, the best radical architects uh, as they saw them in the world at that point to bring them together to produce a publication. Um, and as a historian, more a historian of childhood <laughs> and education, I'm not so much interested in what they went on to, 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 you know, I am interested in their buildings to some extent, but I was more interested in that moment, that moment of uh, con, 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 con confabulation or bringing together of ideas in, with a kind of optimism. Well, more than optimism, with a, an energy which felt unstoppable. And it, I'm much more interested in trying to make sense of that than, I'm sorry, of the, the history of the, arc, you know, the buildings that they went on to produce. Okay. Yeah, no, maybe because just the question would have ended with, uh, you ended up with Woods's argument that we should stop building schools somehow that is also your argument and we uh, should see the city as a school but then of course yes. they ended up designing schools. After. Yes well I know I work with architects who build schools and, and I think you know schools are not terrible places but we have got a problem that we have a very strong set idea about what a school is and what its possibilities are so going back to that email that I received it's so limited. When we think what technology we have today, when we think of the possibilities of learning and living and doing things differently, when we think of the challenges that we have today to uh, enable young people to learn how to live together, not just to learn together, um, it seems to me an urgent question can we stop building schools? Any more questions? Uh, yes, there's one. Michael Pierce. Uh, 
Yes, thanks for both of your interesting talks. And um, I mean, I have a question for each of you in response to what you, uh, to your talks. Um, and maybe I'll start with uh, Evan. I mean, what you, where you ended with uh, this kind of hardened, uh, uh, spoke to me about the current um, uh, discussion in the U.S. around school safety and especially hardening perimeters so that keeping the danger out of the school as a, which of course can also, which can easily translate to keeping the, um, the danger in the school controlled and uh, made me think about, for instance, uh, some of the, the state schools that were built in the early 1970s in the States, like uh, in particular uh, Humboldt, Cal State Humboldt, which was uh, specifically designed to control stu possible student riots. So, <clears throat> and this kind of led me to think about, for instance, films like Over the Edge or um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the People Next Door uh, films from beginning of the 70s and the end of the 70s, which are explicitly about kind of uh, student unrest and social uh, anomie. So I wonder if you could somehow, keeping this kind of lineage of the social imaginary of school defensibility, speak to what, the, what you see in the kind of current climate around uh, possibilities for reimagining uh, the school as a, as maybe an indefensible space, if you if you will, um, and then <coughs> Catherine, if I can, maybe br more briefly, just uh, what what I was thinking about with your talk was um, uh, like a lot of the articles I've read by Will Self, uh, with his perambulations like this, and so that he kind of has reimagined a situationist practice as kind of a marathon walking sessions. And I wonder then, with the importance of feet, if we don't need the school, maybe the school is just a kind of mobile uh, classroom that could be uh, kind of trans transiting the, the, um, the countryside. And that this may be coming from, I don't know if in the UK, like uh, these, uh, 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 wild kindergartens, like forest kindergartens are a thing, but if there's, what kind of possibility there would be for simply not having a school, but having a kind of mobile s classroom, if you Should I briefly say something? I don't know Will Self's work, sorry. Did you, did you say Will Self? Yes, Will Self. He, he's written about walking? A lot. Oh. I should go and read him then. Um, yeah, mobile buses, classrooms, things that move around. I mentioned Tim Ingold, the anthropologist, and his argument is that um, we've lost something precious and important about, a, which is a kind of knowledge that we get through the sensitivity of feet touching the ground. And of course, he talks about uh, earlier sorts of societies where that was very common. Of course, in parts of the world today, that is the way that we touch the ground through bare feet. And so it's a particular kind of sensitivity that I'm interested in. Um, not just mobility, but that kind of touch, that knowledge, that particular kind of knowledge, perhaps that we need to return to in this digital age of machinery and so on. But there's also something else, which is when you walk, you walk with rhythm. And rhythm, rhythmic movement, is also quite interesting in relation to thinking and sorting things out. And there's a whole world of work there to be done on the history of rhythm and rocking and, and movement in the school. Uh, Will Sell, thank you. Um, yeah, and thanks to the question. I mean, excuse me, the, one of the things I sort of skipped over but that's relevant for the question of, of Humboldt is, is the sort of 
the other side of that technique, which is the, also where I did my PhD at Santa Cruz, which in many ways represents a kind of defensive architecture via atomization. So, right, it was sort of master plan for that, designed in 63, built a, one year before, free speech movement, explodes at Berkeley in 64. Kerr is very explicit about the involvement, but basically, you know, for those who haven't been there, it's very beautiful if you do, but it's, um, it's sort of radically spread out. It's the place where, where Jean Baudrillard kind of famously is like, you, how could you have a demonstration here? You'd just march back and forth under the trees speaking to no one. Now, you know, this is thing we practically answered by um, occupying buildings and, and a whole number of kind of complicated things, but I raise that because I think that what I'm sort of trying to get towards is um, to think about the simultaneity uh, and in some sense a uh, relative for a while, these kind of triumph of forms of um, neutralization that can pass under the sign of you know, the, the chance to freely roam, but in many ways are also designed to lack a point of visible collectivity. There's no central gathering point. I'd raise that also because of the question of contemporary securitization and particularly around um, things like school shootings is there's a, a pretty drastic transformation from a, um, a civil society organized around the threat of, um, of organized collectives potentially kind of radical militant collectives versus the figure of the quote unquote lone wolf, even if as we know they often issue from ethnic nationalist communities, et cetera, white nationalists specifically obviously. Um, but there is something really drastic for me in that transformation from a energy of and or fear towards kind of collective organization as opposed to sort of um, fragmentary inchoate individual violence. And I think, you know, because you raised the question of, of um, also kind of popular film, which is a major question of mine. I mean, I would say, um, and I've written a bit on this, that if you track something weird to like the, the genre of undead films, of zombie films, you can see in really dramatic way the shift away from an image of a sort of um, all together now, the dead rise, towards an image of kind of blameable contagion, a one-to-one -one logic. So that's the tricky thing right now is there's, um, one is facing forms of increasing literally militarized um, architecture, but that are predicated on the fantasy of, of the, um, the one who goes bad in some regard. So it's, it's a, yeah, it's a fundamental drift in some sense, I think, from the, the operative forms of mm -hmm. control at work in this period, which I think, you know, I'd sort of suggest that version of landscaping I'm talking about is also production of a kind of, what will eventually be recognizable as an entrepreneurial figure, passes through concrete channels, but does so under the sign of self-exploitation. There's another question. Hey, thank you for your talk. Uh, I Coming from dance and body-based practices, there was something that you referred to with this walk. There is an, uh, there is an element of addressing the bodies with the uh, which was a lot discussed in the other talks related to the architecture and uh, the space that is outside of it. But in your talk, Catherine, there was a clear... Can you put your microphone? Yeah, there was a clear... Uh, uh, there is a clear pointing toward the body, like how the body is addressed in this. And I just... Uh, I think, I don't know if it's more of a comment or more of a... Because we, we talked about the school and how can we not build more schools. Well, this is also very relative in where we are because there are places who are, and there, there, there's a lot of advocacy that we need, like they need this space to be a space of hospitality or for, for that, uh, we need that host space to be able to first host something and then we can revise what it is gonna do. I'm just, uh, yeah, how, like, maybe the question more goes on to this, like how the, beyond the architectural aspect, how, how, how would you consider the, like the entry point to, to thinking about how do we address bodies in education spaces? The entry point? Yeah. Mm. Um, I think I would say to that, what is the entry point in thinking about addressing bodies in education? I would, it's quite an interesting question, and, and I've been thinking about it over the past couple of days, you know, stimulated by this gathering here. 
I think the entry point has to shift much more towards politics and living relationships. And if it, it, it's almost impossible to imagine this, but to pull away from pedagogic, cognitive, psychology, uh, educational thinking, because the body um, is crucial in making choices, in moving, placing itself in relation to others. And relationships are at the heart of democracy and, and de democratic living and civilized living. So um, education is framed by the rise psychology and the rise of cognitive psychology and the rise of the educational professional. I, I'm one of them, I'm an educationalist. But as a historian, I'm aware that at a certain conject conjecture, a certain point in the post-war world, just after the end of the Second World War, there was a real sense that schools were places for the promotion and development and the growing of good living together. And that is a political project. And, and, and so the entry point for me in relation to the body the body in movement, the body making choice, the body making relationships with others is, is more a political framework than a scientific framework, if you like, if you see pedagogy as science. And this is just fresh in my mind. And I know it's provocative and impossible to think about, but I think we could do with thinking the impossible, especially in places like this where, you know, we're encouraged to think beyond the box. I, have a, I, I mean, I have a question more about that we had raised the other day about. Um, no, no, it was actually something that I'd love to ask you about that Tom and I were speaking about the other day, and, and it might be a question that you don't have answer to, but I certainly don't. Um, would also be to think about. I'd be curious to think about how educational architecture has transformed in relation to disability access, because I'm wondering also. I mean, one of the questions I, I, I think the emphasis on thinking the lower body and end of movement is vital, but I'm also at times wary of a different long-standing trope in which non-physical motility equals passivity. There's a certain way in which, like around spectatorship, for instance, there's been, I think, really important critiques of the idea that to, to watch something is therefore to kind of have no agency within it. So I would, yeah, I guess I would just, it's an open question, but I, I was struck by thinking about the, the at, at times radical, at times not radical enough remaking of educational architectures in terms of, of, um, of different forms of access. Yeah. You know, long question. Uh, yes. <clears throat> so, um, thank you very much for, for your presentations. I was, uh, while you two were presenting, uh, there were a few, uh, one question that came to my mind was the connection between walking and barricade. And I was thinking in the moment where, for example, uh, on, uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the US with the Brown versus uh, Board of Education, where walking or a black person walking to school was faced with a barricade of uh, human bodies that would not allow them to get, in, to, to to go to school, to get in the, in the school uh, uh, structure. So I'm wondering if this walking, and uh, you researching on walking, and you researching on barricades, if you are taking in consideration these moments of history that walking uh, is not just out of school, but to school, but it faces with a barricade. Yeah, yeah we should all three get together. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, um, yes, I mean, the, um, the short answer would, only, would be, um, I mean, because there's many ways, but I would say in terms of also some of the history I was gesturing towards the end, and I know you've been also working on, but thinking about the expanded programs of the Panthers, for instance, there's a very, also a different, um, uh, a defense of the right to walk in public space, uh, particularly in terms of the capacity to kind of police the police. So that's that my one thought is that would be a kind of way um, into that to, in some sense, insist upon the, um, or to insist upon a refusal of a certain kind of distance in which police alone have the legitimate right to approach however close they want, which is one that doesn't go to someone else. I think that remains one of the most startlingly 
radical um, tactics and moments in the uh, in American 20th century history. So that's I think would be one um, thing that's been coming to mind in some sense of the the refusal of that prescribed but variable distance. Yes, I mean I I'd have uh, a lot of additional questions, but I but I but I keep myself. Uh, I hold myself back. Um, uh, I would. Um, I mean, I don't have any. I mean, uh, closing remarks, wrapping up uh, the, uh, or trying to wrap up uh, the um, uh, these two days. Uh, this would be uh, rather impossible, or you would need, I don't know, someone like Kojo Esho to do it. Um, so I. Um, so I'd rather like to. Uh, to, to simply thank the two of you and to thank everyone uh, who has been uh, talking uh, during these uh, days, who's been presenting especially. And I would also like to thank, because I've thanked um, the Hakkabit team and uh, everyone who has been uh, instrumental in the production of this event, but I uh, would also like to mention in particular uh, Junia Tide and uh, Sophia uh, Rohwetter uh, um, uh, for their assistance throughout the two days uh, and I would uh, also like to thank uh, Simon Franz Kowiak uh, and uh, Andreas Buchholz uh, from uh, Serviu uh, who have been uh, just, I mean just to name a few names, there are others I um, uh, that could have been named, which I don't have the names right now, but I'm also thanking you. Thank you very much for being, uh, for, for recording this event uh, throughout the days. I would like to thank the uh, interpreters who, aren't, uh, who interpreted, who uh, translated the first session yesterday, and I would like to thank you uh, who have been so uh, patient and uh, interested and uh, throughout these days. It was really uh, that was really quite rewarding, I have to say. So thank you, and we are all looking forward to meeting you again uh, at the latest in September uh, next year uh, uh, during the opening days for, for Education Shock. Thank you very much.